we're jumping into the second chapter of the book of Nehemiah, and I called this section the impossible task. In this section, we're going to see God achieving many things that, from a human perspective, seem impossible. And the key thing that we notice in this text is that the gracious hand of God is on those who trust Him as they do the impossible task He's called them to do. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you just to read this passage a few times for yourself. Try and notice some of the key repeated ideas and how the author has structured the story. Also spend some time praying that God would help you to understand this part of his word and that it would challenge and change you. When looking at any passage in the Bible, it's important to try and notice the structure of that passage. And that's particularly helpful in narrative like this because the structure reveals the emphasis uh, of the story. And a very useful tool to use uh, for narrative is a tool called the narrative plot arc. In the narrative plot arc, uh, you have the setting, you've got some sort of conflict as the story continues. You see some tension building, you get a point of climax in the story and from that point you see a resolution before you get to a new setting and as you look at a narrative a story like this and you notice that structure in the story um, those points of conflict and the way that it resolves itself is normally where the emphasis of the passage is found now interestingly in this story we get uh, a double plot arc. So it looks something like this, and I'll show you that how I saw the structure in a moment. So we get two points of climax in the story that are uh, related, and they'll help us to see the emphasis of the author in this section. So our setting is given in 2 verse 1, where Nehemiah is in the throne room with King Artaxerxes, uh, from chapter 2, verse 2, all the way to verse 8a, we get uh, the conflict. And what we see taking place in that section is uh, Nehemiah explains the reason for his sadness. And he asks the king if he can go home uh, to do the task of, of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And amazingly, at this climactic point which we see in verse 8b, we see this uh, repeated phrase. The first time we see the repetition, the gracious hand of my God. And we see that the gracious hand of God on Nehemiah uh, stirred the king to actually grant his request. And then we see the resolution of the first part in 8 verse 9 to 10. And in those verses, uh, Nehemiah uh, goes home with the mission of and the authorization to actually rebuild the wall. And so the new setting comes in uh, verse 11, where we see Nehemiah is he's returned, he's in Jerusalem again, and a new conflict builds from verse 12 to 17 as Nehemiah surveys the situation. And he explains the problem to the people and he calls them to action. And so we see him walking around the walls and explaining the problem to the people and he calls them to action. And then we see this repeated phrase again. He tells them about the gracious hand of his God who is on him. And so that's the next climactic point. That's verse 18a. He says, because of the gracious hand on Nehemiah, God's gracious hand on Nehemiah, the people respond enthusiastically. And so we see that uh, playing out uh, from resolving itself, the resolution, uh, in verse 18b to verse 20. Again, we see, so the people rally and they say, yep, let's get going. But then uh, we see the enemies come, Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab come. Uh, to try and oppose the people, stop them working. But Nehemiah displays his trust in God. And that takes us to our new setting in chapter 3. 
where we see the people uh, getting together and working side by side to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, as you notice a structure like that and these climactic points, we see that they uh, help us to understand what's going on in this text. And so we see the gracious hand of God is on those who trust him. And we're going to see uh, Nehemiah's trust in God come out in this structure for the impossible task that he's called him to do. Nehemiah was in Susa, 1,600 kilometers away from his hometown. And he goes to the king, the most powerful man on the planet, and asks him to send him home to rebuild the walls of what would have been an obscure city for this king. Uh, but we see the gracious hand of God on Nehemiah granting that request. So just a couple of other things to notice, repetition in the story. So he talks a lot about the city and he's talking here about uh, the city of Jerusalem, which is in Judah. He's wanting to build the city walls. So there's a big focus on Jerusalem, but it's not so much because Nehemiah wanted to rebuild the city. It's because of what that city meant. It was called the city of our God, a great psalm to go and cross-reference would be Psalm 48, where it is called the city of our God or Zion. And it was meant to be the place that people would point to and say they have an incredible God. But at this point, uh, the city was broken. That's what stirred Nehemiah to go home. He wanted God's name and fame promoted in all the world. And we see throughout this section, he speaks uh, about the God of heaven and uh, the gracious hand of my God. He didn't tell anyone what God had put in his heart yet. Again, he says, the God of heaven. He calls them his servants. What my God had put in my heart. So Nehemiah knows and loves this God. The prayer in chapter 1 has shown this very clearly. And he wants this God, he wants this God's name and fame to be made known. And that's why he goes and says, we want to rebuild Jerusalem. He says, let's, the people reply, let's start rebuilding after he has rallied the troops in verse 17 and come and said, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And then he says, we will start rebuilding this wall. He's going to be rallying the troops to do the work of rebuilding. And he says, it says here, so they began this good work. Um, interestingly, this phrase, uh, is more accurately translated, so they strengthened their hands. They strengthened their hands for this good work. So the gracious hand of God on them strengthened their hands for this good work of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah is the man who, who rallies the troops. Um, we see him in focus throughout the story. Now, if you see that kind of repetition, obviously he's a key character. So not only is this a narrative plot arc a good tool to use, but also when you, you notice characters in the story, so Nehemiah is a key character. In the first part of the story, uh, we see uh, the king, Artaxerxes, is obviously a key character there. And along with Nehemiah, we also see him speaking of a few others or the Jews or uh, grouping them together. So we are no longer a disgrace and the people respond, they. Some other characters who are going to become increasingly important as the story goes, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah. Uh, so they are enemies of God's people and we'll see them uh, rear their ugly heads a few times through the story. They're just kind of introduced uh, in the second chapter, but they're going to become more and more prominent, uh, trying to stop the good work that God has called his people to do. Interestingly, we also see uh, the queen introduced here. Now, uh, commentators make uh, different points about this. 
but she probably wouldn't have normally been with King Artaxerxes in the throne room, so it probably means this was a special occasion, something like the king's birthday, uh, or something like that, and so that may have helped the king to be favor favorably disposed towards Nehemiah, but all of that is God at work by his gracious hand in the details, um, working everything out for the good of Nehemiah, this one who trusts in the Lord. And how do we know that Nehemiah trusts the Lord? Well, we see it in a few places. One of them is here, then I prayed. So before answering the king, after the king says, what do you want? He prayed. That shows his trust in the Lord. And then he says at the end here, the God of heaven will give us success. It's a great statement of trust. He, he's absolutely convinced that God will give them success in this task ahead of him. And so we see in here the gracious hand of God is on those people like Nehemiah who trust in him as they do the impossible task. In this case, it's going uh, to the city of Jerusalem to rally the troops to say, let's rebuild, come, let us rebuild the wall. And we see the gracious hand of God at work. Uh, stirring the hearts of the people so that they say, yeah, let's get going. Let's start rebuilding. So they began this good work or their hands were strengthened for this good work. Even in the spite of opposition that comes, God rallies the truth, troops and they, they are confident. God will give us success. And remember, what is the thing that Nehemiah had come to do? It was much more than just rebuilding Jerusalem's walls. He wanted to promote God's name and fame. God's name and fame in the world. Now, as we look at an Old Testament story like this and we reflect on it theologically, we also see that Nehemiah points us ahead to our Lord Jesus, who also left the throne room, a bigger throne room than Nehemiah left. He left the throne room of heaven and he came to do the task that he had planned with his father uh, before time began. It was a task that was on his heart, but it was much more than just rebuilding Jerusalem. His task was going to be to ultimately lift God's name and fame high in all the world as he died for the sins of humanity to make us into a community of people who belong to God. And as those now who trust in Jesus, the gracious hand of God is now on us. And that same gracious hand that strengthened Nehemiah to do the impossible task ahead of him is the same gracious hand of God that is now at work in us, as strengthening us as we trust in God to do the impossible, to make God's name and fame known in the world around us. That gracious hand of God is strengthening us for that task ahead. Well, as you dig further into this passage, I pray that it would encourage you, stir your heart, and as you see what a great and awesome God we serve. And then as you teach it to others, uh, let's prayerfully uh, teach it in a way, hoping that God would stir hearts, that people would trust that God's gracious hand is indeed on those who trust him as they do the impossible task he's called them to do. In Nehemiah's case, it was the task of promoting God's name and fame in the world. And that's the same for us. So may we be strengthened to do God's work for His glory. Well, God bless as you dig in further. Mm -hmm.